Writing Out Loud, a program designed to explore in-depth interviews with writers to hear that words have voices. Hello everyone, I'm Teresa Miller and welcome to Writing Out Loud. My guest today is best-selling author Clifton Talbert and lecturer and you do a little bit of everything, Cliff. It's amazing. A book can take you to places you've never been. Well, <laughs> Emily Dickinson was right. Emily Dickinson was right. It, it can take the reader to places you've never right. been and it can take you as a writer. It to most certainly does. I was thinking back to your first book, Once Upon a Time When We Were Colored. Do you realize it's been 20 years? You know, I, I tried not to. I, I knew you were going to come up with those decades and, and compress <laughs> them into 20 years, but it's amazing. It, you know, it's amazing that 20 years ago, my life popped out on the American writing scene, uh, really stretching me beyond my imagination. And you haven't, hadn't even intended to write a book, had you? Well, I, I had intended to write a book, but I never thought the book would be a book. I, 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 I was just trying to capture the memories of these incredible people that took care of me. I, I wanted to say thank you in a very dignified way. I had no idea that the book would sell beyond Tulsa, Oklahoma, to be quite honest. Well, and through that book you found your calling because we're, we're showing a, a poster here with all your various books, and one way or the other, they're all related to that early experience. Oh, that most you had definitely. And Glenn I mean, Allen. Yeah, it's most definitely. You know, it's like I, I dug a well, and it was deeper than I thought, <laughs> and the water was better than I ever imagined it could be. And it just keeps coming. And it just keeps coming. It just keeps coming. You know, when you look back at, at that book now, it's such a wonderful, warm book. I, I wanted to move to Glen Allen. I got on the internet and looked up Glen Allen. Everybody did. We felt that way. We wanted to be part of your extended family. As an older writer, when you think about that story, is there any chance that you might have, have made it a little better than it really was? I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I think that's the neat thing about time. Mm -hmm. You know, at the time I wrote that book, uh, my feelings about my family and what I wanted to celebrate. It seemed to be that was something that America and African Americans in particular needed at that time. Why? We, we, yeah, we, we needed that moment in time of realizing that in spite of the life that surrounded us that may have had dire circumstances, inside of our homes there were these incredible people that made the difference in our lives. And, and it gave us reasons to celebrate that in spite of legal segregation and all that it brought to our table, we had a table that legal segregation was not welcome to. Mm. What was the hardest life lesson you had to learn when you were a little boy? You know, I, I think it was to really take the world as it was given me. And, and I mean that in the sense that as a little kid, you really don't sit in your room at night and ask the hard questions mm -hmm. about race or mm -hmm. about why your grandparents can't do this or they can't do that. But you, you, you end up with this feeling that everything is all right because they are all right with you. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 you learn to accept this world that is not really providing you the best of things, but it's the only world you know. And, and I think to me that was the hardest thing, now that I look back, is, is not questioning, but really just totally accepting the love that they gave me, and, and sort of looking around those other circumstances. Did it ever occur to you or your family that one day we would have an African-American president of the United States? Uh, Teresa, that never really entered my mind as a reality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the inauguration and the, of, of uh, President Barack Obama was, uh, you, you know, it has is, it is meant so much to so many people on so many different levels. But speaking specifically for me, as an African-American male in our society, it was the most incredible night of my life because I had a chance to see this country do something, be part of something that I never thought that I'd see. Mm. Maybe one of these days this whole country will become Glen Allen. You know, it's about community because uh, Glen Allen certainly had its, had its faults, and, uh, but it also had its great moments. And those moments all centered around people, ordinary people, who literally wanted to do extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, 
You took your son Marshall back to Glen Allen. You've written a book about it called The Journey Home, A Father's Gift to His Son. What did you want Marshall to discover in Glen Allen that he wasn't going to find through your books? I, I wanted him to touch the people. I wanted him to understand that commitment and accountability, those are linked to people. And it's not just about him. It's about his life as it relates to others, their expectations, and have him to understand that Marshall, as you grow up and become a man, you also become part of the system that perpetuate the dreams and visions of others. And he needed to see these people that were almost 100 years old. I wanted him mm -hmm. to go to their house. I wanted him to be in their presence where they ask the hard questions, like how are your grades? Are you going to college? <laughs> you know, all the things that, you know, you don't really get kids, you don't get that level of inquisition today, as it were. But in my day, I mean, you had to give an account of your life yeah. because people were be believing in you. They were depending upon you to further their dreams. So I had to take Marshall back to experience that. Yeah. So many of those values that you're talking about are carried over into your wonderful motivational book, Eight Habits of the Heart. It's become a touchstone book for you. It in, has in been. In many ways. And it never gets old. I mean, it's just growing in all sorts of wonderful directions. And I'm not going to have you go through all eight habits. People need to read the book and experience it. But talk about the three habits you consider most important. Well, the first would be nurturing attitude, because nurturing attitude has everything to do with how we are willing to allocate our time for the benefit of others. It's about unselfishness raised to a very high level. Mm -hmm. It's being there for others through all the times of their lives, a steady influence that makes tomorrow a welcome event. And you can take nurturing attitude, Teresa, into every arena of our lives, as I currently do, whether I'm talking to Fortune 500 leaders, whether I'm talking to men who are incarcerated or women who are incarcerated, I'm, I'm asking the same question. We're all given 24-7, but it's up to us as to how we use that. And, and, and of course, I experienced total unselfishness from my great-grandparents who, to me, embodied nurturing attitude. And then, of course, there's dependability, mm -hmm. you know, being there for others through all the times of, your, of, the, of their lives. And that was my great aunt, Mama Punk, who's in <laughs> every book that I write. I can't write a book without writing about her. You know, this is a lady that was absolutely determined that I'd get an education when, you know, it was not as easily, easily done as it was said. So she had to put herself out in order to make this happen, and she did. So it gives me a clear picture that dependability is not a word, just a word in Webster's Dictionary. But dependability has to be an individual. It has to be a good employee, a good employee. It has to be a good son or a good husband or a good wife. It's a person. And then, of course, high expectations. Mm. Believing that other people can be successful. You know, when you believe that someone can be successful, you're willing to do those things that are necessary in order to make that happen. And, uh, and for me, it was so critical when I was growing up for my paths to run across average men and women who looked beyond my circumstances and said, you're going to make something out of yourself, and this is how we're going to help you do it. And interestingly, now you become a role model to people because of your success. You know, I, I, it, yeah, I, I would say that, and, and I always try to I, I play down the success from the standpoint of material things, but I look at the success in that I was able, through the help of others, to move beyond the circumstances that would have defined my life. Does this put pressure on you the way since you write about the eight habits of the heart and we need to be good? And so yeah. you're in the airport and they've got your ticket mixed up and you're going to be delayed. And so you can't get mad like the rest oh, of Oh, yes, us. I can. Okay. But what I do, and this is honestly, I began to think, and that's what these habits do. They, they circle your wagon, if it were. And, and when you find yourself in a situation where you're trying to think, all of a sudden you go, no, wait, wait, wait. These people have a job to do. You know, what am I talking about? All of a sudden, I have to realize that I have to step back, and it is this idea of community. It's this idea of realizing that it's not always about me. And I step back. I find myself, it's boiling up, but I find myself turning that knob, turning it down. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the power of eight habits of the heart. They don't keep stuff out of your life, but they give you the ability to deal with the stuff that comes into your life. Mm -hmm.